Um, firstly, thank you for inviting me. I'm very conscious of the honour. Um, fantastic place, fantastic people, fantastic grapper. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I'm, I'm conscious that what I'm going to talk about is far from the interests of most of you. I'm not down there at the crack tip. I'm not interested in fracture mechanics. I'm interested on a much larger scale in doing practical things that will enable structures to survive extreme events, in particular fire. Fire has been what I've worked on for 25, 27 years now, as Luca, Luca implied. Actually, I'm only going to talk about the last five years. <laughs> um, robustness is a new English word, um, which you probably will not get a decent definition from, from the, the, the normal dictionary, but it basically talks about the ability of structures to um, avoid disproportionate collapse when localised um, catastrophes happen. You know, it's nice if, you, if your local failure stays local. Why do we want it? Because we saw this happen on the 11th of September 2001. In particular, for me, uh, I mean, there are plenty of reasons why, why those, those pictures occurred. Uh, not, not least to do with, the, you know, massive structural damage and then, then massive multi-storey fires. Less well remembered is the fact that at 5, 520 on the same day, a building in the vicinity, uh, Seven World Trade, which had seemed to be hardly, hardly damaged by the collapse of the other two buildings, actually suddenly fell down after having had unfought fires at various various levels, but that was all really. You know, uh, the, the the folklore amongst the fire brigades was that uh, generally fires burn out in such buildings. This didn't; it just fell down. Forty-seven story office block, and there were, there are some lessons to be to be gained from that. Um, let me first, since since you're not well, I, I'm assuming you're not really into into materials at high temperatures. Let me, I have one slide which, which um, encapsulates for me the, um, the, behave, the problems with steel at high temperatures. Number one, steel gets to, well, the curve I haven't plotted here, 900 degrees centigrade. Um, it is probably working at 6% of its normal strength, the strength for which it was designed. Um, in a, in a building fire, if there was a fire in here, given a decent amount of ventilation from the windows, um, the temperatures would probably get to 1200. Um, if we have restricted ventilation, the fire would last a much longer, but get well over 900 degrees. So th this is the scale of the problem we're talking about. <laughs> that's, that's the traditional view of steel in fire. It gets weak. What we now know is, is perhaps more important even is the effect of thermal expansion of steel. In that building I was talking about, WTC7, um, certain beams which, which are blamed for the collapse would have actually expanded by 100 millimetres had they been allowed to freely. In fact, they pushed on another beam, broke its connection, and the whole thing then, then becomes a progressive collapse. Okay, let's now. For me, the most vulnerable part of a building um, in, in fire is connections. Connect, the connections in particular between beams and columns. A beam will get hot in a fire, lose strength, expand a bit, <coughs> sag massively, but nothing really catastrophic will happen. No one would ever think of uh, not protecting columns because if the columns buckle, your building collapses. Between the two are these fairly vulnerable elements called connections. And I'll just give you a quick cartoon sequence. This is idiot level, but okay, we're talking tourism here. Um, of the forces that, that occur on connections from beams during the progress of a fire. So here we are in two dimensions. I, I have a fire in the level of the structure. The, the first thing that really becomes important to the structure is that that beam starts to expand. It expands by one millimeter per meter per hundred degrees. Um, 
modern beams in modern office structures may be 15 meters, 17, 18 meters long. People don't want columns when they're developing a building these days. So you can see the, the amount of expansion that you could actually get. And therefore, that's being restrained by columns and the connections are in the way, therefore they transmit the forces and massive compression forces are generated. And this, this is the sort of damage that you see after a fire in the region of a, a connection that really hasn't, it hasn't broken, but, but it's, it, it's effectively distorted the beam to shorten it to, to fit into the space. At a later stage, of course, when we're up in the 900,000 degree region, the loss of strength of the beam is, is the key factor. And the beam essentially loses all its, its bending strength um, and starts to hang like a catenary cable between, between its, the same connections. And therefore the connections are now subject to tensile forces, tying forces are, are what we tend to, to describe them as, normal, forces normal to the column. So, so the whole direction in which these horizontal forces have, uh, are, are acting has changed. They were probably designed for vertical shear only because that's a very common structural practice. Um, unusually, they might be designed for a bit of a moment if, if we have a very picky structural engineer designing the structure, but never for horizontal force. And this, this is the sort of picture we get at this, this catenary stage. And here's a picture from a real fire test um, in the mid-1990s. And here is the sort of, oh, come back, come back, come back, come back. Okay, this is the sort of shear buckling and tension field action that will happen in that, in that final panel of the beam. And what, the, what that says to me, as, as someone who tries to think fairly qualitatively about the way structures work, is that the failure of that connection is very probably going to start up the top in the, these bolts that are designed just to carry vertical shear and is going to proceed down the connection uh, as a sort of unzipping. Yeah, it's a, a large scale analogy to your, to your crack propagation. Um, and therefore it's local, <coughs> local failure that, that, that initiates the, the failure of the connection. If a, if a connection fails, why, why are we interested? Number one, the fire spreads. One of the, one of the key objectives of fire engineering design is to prevent the fire from spreading into other levels of the structure or to other buildings because that is extremely dangerous once a fire becomes a multi-level fire. And you can see that, you know, if we double the effective length of that column, if you can remember your structural mechanics, um, it becomes considerably weaker especially when it's hot. Um, and then we also get debris landing on the floor below, um, stressing that, the connections down there. And this is one of the scenarios known as pancaking that was originally put up after the failure of the Twin Towers, that uh, floors had uh, detached, come down on lower floors, which were in those cases also heated by, by these multi-storey fires and therefore weak in themselves. And a, a, a sort of a progressive pancaking of floors on floors within the columns of the structure had taken place. In the end, that wasn't the scenario that, uh, that became the favoured one for the Twin Towers. But it's, it's, a, it's a very credible phenomenon. Uh, I'm going to get it here what happens when you leave a column uh, unsupported over many floors, um, you know, it's fairly obvious. So, a bit of a summary here. Columns are just so important that you do whatever you can to support columns, to protect columns. No one in their right mind takes any risk with columns. But connections have the, have the capability, joints or connections, have the capability of initiating progressive failure. And here's a, here's a summary, in fact, of the, the sort of force to which the connection is, is subjected. You can see that almost instantly, before, before the temperature of the steel beams have got to 100 degrees, um, 
the, the sign of the force in the, in the steel member has reversed, become massively compressive, 60 tons we're talking about, um, throughout all that range there. And then the loss of strength takes over, and eventually um, the beam hangs in catenary, just thus reversing the force on the connections. Now you may say um, that force is fairly low, but of course we're talking about the high temperature regime here. So really, I shouldn't have plotted strength in terms of kilonewtons or axial force in terms of kilonewtons. I should have divided that by the, by the, the current strength of the steel, in which case that, that would be a much more significant looking, looking value over there. Oh, and of course everything cools at this stage. And the beams which are heated between restraints provided by the columns and the other structure around have effectively got shorter because they've had to stay in the same space. When they cool, um, they recover their thermal expansion in a beam that is now getting stiffer and stronger and connections which are getting stiffer um, and, and are pulling hugely on those connections and, and failures in cooling are very, very uh, likely to happen. Now you may say, when the fire is dying down, why should I worry about failures happening? Well, unfortunately, it's not just building inhabitants we're talking about. It's people who are trying to rescue, uh, protect. If, 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 say, it is not known whether there are still people in the building, then the fire service may be in there, firefighters may be in there, and at that stage, um, they, they're going to be very vulnerable to failures in cooling. I'll show you a few failures in cooling. These are from the tests in the mid-1990s at a place called Cardington in the UK. All have happened in, in, in cooling. Here, uh, a thin plate connection has completely sheared its bolts by the, by the beam contracting in cooling. These others are weld failures on one side of end plate connections. Here is, oh, I've, got a, I've got some highlighting. Yeah, there we go. This one is, is an end plate connection, a full end plate connection, fairly stiff in itself, which has simply pulled its bolts off the connection by, by stripping the threads um, within, within, its, within its nuts. And clearly at that stage the whole thing can fall. Um, if we look at the sequence, what, what typically happened to those, those connections in the Carlington fire tests, whoops, um, actually goes like this. The, uh, the connection heated, went into massive compression, causing buckling in the beam, beam webs and flanges, and then cooling took place uh, before, the, before the beam had even got into the tension zone. At that stage, one side of the connection fractured, thus making the connection vastly less stiff and allowing much more ductility, and therefore, in fact, survival took place. Now, for me, this, give, this gives a clue as to where perhaps designers ought to be trying to take their, their connections in the future. Try and generate ductility um, at the same time as as allowing survival, bare survival, of the connection. If, the, if both sides of that connection stay, stay unfractured, then it's, it's a stiff device which resists and therefore fails. If you can gain ductility by, by having a, a partial fracture, then that's perhaps one tactic for survival. Right, so, what I would like to do is allow designers in, in the initial phase of designing large buildings, you wouldn't do it for everyday buildings, um, to run scenario-based analyses of how the structure will behave um, in various types of fire. Um, and the only way of doing this, I, 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 I thought about this for years because um, no one had ever really 
thought about the way that connections behave under combinations of forces at the same time as high temperatures. Um, for ambient temperature design, normal design of buildings, there, there had been a, a theory developed over 30 years and is now in Euro Code 3. Um, for semi-rigid design, in other words, designers wanted to take advantage of the fact that connections, which they might have thought of as simple hinges, um, actually have some rigidity and they could optimize the building a bit um, by, by optimizing using the moment and rotation characteristics of the connection. Um, they had tried to do this in various ways, by holding databases of connection behavior, um, and by developing something called, called the, component, the component method, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. Um, when I thought about the, or when we thought about the, the prospects of using a database of connection characteristics in fire, we, start, we suddenly thought moment, rotation, axial force in either direction, movement in either direction, temperature, a five-dimensional database, no, we didn't want to, it wasn't, it wasn't possible. But uh, one morning I, 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 ha I was in the shower and thought, um, if we use the component method, the component method basically takes those those basic zones of structural action within the connection and considers them as, as nonlinear springs. Now, you will all be horrified at that. And I'm horrified at it because it says um, these are all unconnected. You know, there, there is no, no coupling between any of these zones of structural action. Um, the people who use the component method say, yeah, we know that. Um, we're having to make a horrible assumption and we'll deal with it in whatever way is practical. Um, you know, by add, adding the odd factor here and there, or not, the odd factor here and there. So, this practical method represents these zones of structural action as springs. Nonlinear springs, and you can see the normal use, put a moment on the connection, and we can, we can get a view of the stiffness of the connection, and more accurately, we can get a, a, a much better view of the strength of the connection. It's always terrible, the stiffness, as you, as you, you would go. Now, if you're doing nonlinear analysis anyway, global analysis of structure, an extra force is nothing. It's just part of the equilibrium of that bunch of, bunch of springs within the whole structural assembly. And we're doing that anyway. So, this is what the, the elements that uh, one of my research students devised a few years ago um, to try and adequately represent the behavior of the connection zone, the, the very face of the column zone in fire. And it's, it's fairly sensible, but it, it, it includes bits which, which only work in compression. These bits up the top only work when the, the beam end is, is, is pushed against the column face. And if we, if we want to go a bit more complete with it, then we include the, the shear panels within the, the end of the beam, which you, you know, you've seen actually, actually do influence the behavior of the connection. And then we put, the, put this combination of forces on, and we get that, that bunch of actions all taking place. Now, the, the objective is to simply include this into the, the fairly simplified nonlinear global analysis of, of the frame structure. We have to avoid at all costs throwing, throwing two million um, abacus solid elements at each connection of the structure. No structural engineer has the time to do any of that. You know, they have three, maybe three weeks to do a tender design. Um, and then they can perhaps go into a bit more detail occasionally. But we, we don't have time for that. Um, if we want to uh, do this properly, of course, we have to acknowledge that certain columns also have a problem. Edge columns will, will have to be a, have a, a shear panel put into them as well. And this is, this is the way I want it represented. I want, oops, sorry, pressing the wrong things. 
strictly beam elements required fairly complicated beam elements with temperature variation and stuff like that in. Um, beam elements in the columns, and then single elements for these shear panels, and a single element which includes in a black box all the behavior of those various components and their, and their temperatures um, to represent the, the, the column face zone. Whoops, I'm going to have to go a bit faster. Um, this is what you tend to see as the failure of a, a connection in the end. You can see here that with broken bolts, broken bolts there. So, what we've done recently is to actually assemble from component, component characteristics that we've characterized over the last few years. Sort of two-noded uh, column elements. Um, I probably don't have time to go through this sequence, but, but the the behavior of the uh, of end plate connections tends to be characterized, um, and this is this is in the Eurocode method as well for, for small deflections in terms of what they call T stones, and uh, it's a it's an obvious way of rationalizing something that's a continuum into into discrete springs, and we'll just see the sequence of what happens. You get a prying phase. You get a phase where, where the bolts are strictly carrying the force through to the, to the column face. And then, of course, you have to deal with the business of reversal of forces, because forces will reverse at every, pretty much at every point of the connection. So, and in the end, the sort of uh, characteristics we get for our, for our components, uh, these individual springs, look a bit like this. We have to take into account clearly the unloading phase and that's, that's been a, an absolutely uh, key element for us. It's not just when the fire is heating, it's when it's cooling and even when it's heating some components will change the direction. It's a nightmare. Um, this bit here is, is of course when, when bolts are being pushed back. And bolts don't work in compression. Um, because you, they simply slip in their holes. And so we generate a permanent slip, a permanent set on our, on our bolts. And in the end, um, we have to think at any stage of the fire and any, any stage of the force displacement behavior of an effective um, force displacement curve, which is a long way away from the, the one that we started with. How do, we, how do we relate one temperature to another? I, I, I haven't got time to describe to you the, the, the time we took um, worrying about how, what would happen when we, we, we've got a component up, up to one temperature and, and over the next five seconds the temperature changed and effectively we were on to a different stress strain curve. And it all comes from the the unloading behavior, because the permanent set between the two curves is the same. Now, this, in, or, in order to, um, to get evidence that we could validate and verify against, we, we've done a lot of experiments at Sheffield. It, it's totally against my nature to do experiments. Most of my career has been absolutely on sheets of paper and, uh, and uh, magnetic disk. Um, but but we, we just had to do our own experiments. We couldn't rely on other people. They hadn't done the right things. What we wanted was to test whole connections and under these combinations of catenary tension, um, shear, and, and moment that you get in that final phase um, in a real building. So we devised something like this within a, within a one meter cube furnace and a reaction frame. Um, basically, we pulled on the the, the connections via this, this linkage. So heat the thing up, pull this thing down. How do you measure um, something that's at 650 degrees or 700 degrees? Difficult with strain gauges um, or extremely expensive with strain gauges. 200 pounds of strain gauge, um, 250 euros a strain gauge, uh, and absolutely no returns if they don't work. 
that's one thing the, the manufacturers specify. So we've actually done it by cameras. We have windows in our furnace, and we, we found that uh, using, using cameras was a remarkably effective way given that we, we're talking about large displacements and large strains in the fire um, of measuring those things. And that's our setup. See the specimen inside. And you can see the views from the, the, uh, the three cameras that we use to get a, get a bit of a, a check on one another. And the sorts of components we have, we have characterized using mechanics and, and then using uh, a load of these very detailed abacus analyses at high, high temperatures. And that, that's not an end plate connection, it's a, it's a web cleat, but it was the best picture I had to illustrate. But you can see the sorts of shapes that these, these, these springs actually generate, some extremely stiff, some of them clearly capable of, of, of fairly, <coughs> fairly extreme fracture. Uh, and the, the compression only components that you get when, when flanges just butt into each other. I'll uh, just show you these. We, we've done about 15, 16 tests on, on end plate connections, which is all I'll talk about today. This is the sort of fracture you get. Slight, slightly cheating here because if you look at the condition of the ends of the bolts, they're clearly at ambient temperature, they're at 20 degrees. Um, and that was simply because of the quality of the photos you get um, with, with those tests. We also did them at, at a lot of high temperatures. And this sort of summarizes the range of angles of uh, attack, in other words, the ratio of shear to, to axial tying force, and the temperatures at which we, we tested those. And these are, don't even bother to look, you, these, these are just what you get out of the experiments. We've now represented those tests with, with fairly, fairly simple-minded um, component, component elements, these two noted elements that we can put into our analysis. Um, we can do it with, with different representations of material properties. This, what's coming up here in, in red is, is a very simple-minded representation of the material properties, and you'll see that Okay, it's good at 20 degrees, but, but it's, it's not adequate at, at um, 650 degrees. Except that what we're actually interested in is this. It's, it's the failure that we're interested in in robustness terms. I do not really care, and I don't think any, any real designer should care, about the, the sort of stiffness rate of a connection or its early behavior, provided we have our, our levels of failure forces fairly well characterized at, at whatever temperatures, then I think, I think we, we have something that's adequate. Um, this is not to say that we're not actually trying to uh, refine this a bit. Okay. Well, uh, we're now at the stage where we, we, we have our uh, our component-based elements sorted out. We have lots of validation against, against um, high temperature testing of whole connections and, and components themselves. And a, a parallel development has made it quite easy for us to promulgate to the profession the idea that they can do um, a, a whole, a fire scenario based. In other words, you put a fire of a certain shape into, the, into a certain part of the structure and you, you simply let a global analysis of a very large part of a building, perhaps not a whole building, but, but a very large part of it, simply run and show you what happens. And then you can do your amendment of the, the structural details. And that's um, the the, the development we did to our own software, which it was not clever in any sense, it, it's just, it was just fairly obviously something we needed, was, was to enable our analysis to be quasi-static for the parts which are stable, and then dynamic for the bits which are, which are unstable. And if you think about it, what, what, 
drove me to this was looking at the tests. Because during, during a test of a connection, a bolt will break. The bolt breaks, the, uh, the, uh, the load falls, and then it restabilizes. The, the other bolts pick up, pick up the forces. And your, your full characteristic up to connection failure is really quite a long way away from the failure of that initial component. And everyone who uses finite element software, you know, sort of has this experience of quasi-static analysis. Just, just sort of finishing at the first time, so at the first time the curve goes unstable. And we really didn't want that to happen. But we, we, we just, for our own analyses, made it capable that, of, of flying when the, when the structure flies, um, and then restabilizing and going static again um, when, the, when the structure restabilizes. So, this is a, oh yeah, okay, it's a pretty simple-minded picture illustrating that. And what we have done is, is put it into, into our own software, which is a fairly simple sort of um, frame, more and more non-linear frame analysis software um, designed for fire cases. Um, I've run out of time, so I'm going to flip through. This is just some evidence that it works. Oh, what I want to show you is this, because this is a fairly simple um, analysis that we did just to prove that things work, and it's, it's quite recent and a, a very simple sort of structure. Um, what you see is that we, we put a, I put a fire into this compartment, the beam is getting heated by a certain temperature theta at, at any time during the fire, um, the columns which are always protected Get, get hot slowly. So that column gets, gets hot at half the rate and we have component based elements for the connections of either ends of the beam. Now it, it, it runs fairly quickly and you'll see what happens. These... So you saw the beam falling. Um, these are the forces in, in the the bolt rows of, of a five a five row connection at either end. And you can see that they fail progressively and the, the analysis continues, um, flies between the, the 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 individual failures. And then finally the connection is being held by its bottom bolt, which was only there for location probably. And finally after a very large rotation that breaks as well and the beam falls. But the fire hasn't finished yet, so the fire continues to heat the surroundings. And you can see now that the column, fire, and, and so what to me that, that gives us is, is an illustration that we can do the whole scenario um, in a fairly simple fashion. You know, without without taking weeks setting setting up an analysis that a, that a designer can actually use um, in order to amend the details of what they're doing. In this case, they probably have gone for a more ductile kind of connection um, rather than a stronger type of connection. And I these are just a few conclusions. They're all obvious. Don't worry about them. Thank you very much. Thank you.